Okay, let's get started. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Surprising Readers and Ourselves, playing with hermit crab essays, poems, and stories. Um, I'm Judith McIntosh. I write as J.A. McIntosh, and I am on the program committee of the Straw Dog Writers um, Guild. Um, like watching a movie on TV, before we get to faith, you're going to have to listen to my commercial about Straw Dog. Um, Straw Dog um, supports and inspires writers in Western Massachusetts. Um, if you are not a member, I very much um, encourage you to become a member. We do these programs every month, uh, 10 months a year. We don't do them in July and August. And um, there, there's craft programs, there's marketing programs, they're all free, some are in person, some are on Zoom, but um, you really do get your money's worth if you, if you join Straw Dog Writers Guild. Um, we also have a Writers Read um, in coming in January where um, members of Straw Dog um, are chosen by lottery to read. Um, I believe that's going to be a hybrid event that we haven't quite finalized that yet. Um, Straw Dog also does a writer's night out. Our next writer's night out will be October 17th. Um, and Doug Anderson will be our featured speaker. Um, other folks can come in um, and, and th there is an open mic portion and then there is um, the featured speaker. So that's that's another service that's done by um, Straw Dog. We also do a um, um, Wednesday um, evening writing meetup, which is not taking place tonight because we have faith, um, but um, Steve Brewer does that. And before I go any further, I do want to do a shout out to both Becky Jones and Steve Brewer, who are the technical people tonight, got everybody registered, everybody here, and are doing a wonderful job. <laughs> Um, we also have a second Sunday open mic. We have poetry critiques. We have other writing experiences. So you, so Straw Dog really is trying to reach out to all of the four counties in Western Massachusetts. It's a great use of your time and your money. And I very much encourage you, if you don't belong to join, if you do join, donate so that we can continue in um, this um, situation. So um, tonight, um, uh, Faith Adele, and I, she says it much more musically than I do, but um, I believe that's a correct, the correct um, pronunciation, um, is going to do a presentation. I am asking everyone to mute themselves um, when she comes on so that we don't get a lot of background noise. And also while she's doing the presentation, I will be monitoring the chat. So if you have questions, um, want something clarified, put it in the chat. Um, I'm not saying that I can monitor it in real time, but eventually we will get to your question. So um, I first met Faith when I was in the MFA program at Stone Coast. Um, I was in the fiction department and I heard her speak and I went, I wanna know more about this woman. She was in the creative nonfiction portion, which meant that I had to go be between sections to get into her section. But I heard her speak in my very first semester there and I, I believe I've heard her speak every semester I was there. Um, and um, because she was just such a dynamic speaker. And when we were talking about doing um, hermit crabs, I thought, well, I know just the person to do this. So she is here tonight and I am thrilled to have her here. Um, Faith has, has written a book called Meeting Faith, which is an account of her becoming Thailand's first black nun, um, Buddhist nun. Um, it is, it is, it's a, it's a very, creative look at what she did, and I would encourage everybody to read it. She also has written Her Voice and VoiceOver, which is which is a story about growing up as a Nigerian Nordic American in the Pacific Northwest. As I've already said, she teaches at the MFA program in Stone Coast. She also teaches at the California College of the Arts, where she is tonight, um, and or I believe she's at home tonight, but she is in California tonight, which is why this is a Zoom event. So, um, without any further ado, I present you Faith Adele. Hey, hi everybody. Yep, I saw everybody for a second, now I'm spotlighted and I see me and Steve. <laughs> so you're going to have to be very, very expressive, Steve, because I'm like counting on you to bring it all home, or maybe I'll change my thing so I can see some beautiful people. Hi. Hey. I see some people I know and some people I'm excited to know. Thank you so much for spending 90 minutes of your time with me or however much time you can make today. And shout outs to my old friends, Lisa, Ryan, who are in the room. And I think Amelia is going to be coming in. So I love it when people show up. 
Um, okay, so um, <clears throat> how many of you, just from a show of hands or thumbs up, are already familiar with the hermit crab situation? You've done them. Okay, cool. So <laughs> I like the explosion back there. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> well, great. Um, okay, so let me share my screen. I like always to be um, in terms of accessibility, have stuff have stuff that's visual as well as oral. Um, is everyone seeing that? Okay, cool. So, um, oh, so this is just a little bit of kind of what I do. And you'll see that I'm really interested in structure. So uh, my memoirs, my chat books, I do documentary, I do calm stories, and I'm always really kind of interested in structure and how playful structure can help us deal with, you know, kind of important topics. I always have a kind of a, a playful and a serious approach to things. Um, and so what I thought I would do is just quickly kind of go over the definition and the history of things that influence what we now know as hermit crabs. This form has been around for a lot, for a long time, but then this it's been renamed the hermit crab. Um, and then I have a whole bunch of slides that show kind of best practices, some of the rules, as well as examples, all different kinds of examples. And then we can chat about those. Um, and then we'll work on some of our own. And then if there's time, you, uh, we'll do a little optional sharing and then Q and A. So does that sound cool? Everybody, Stephen's giving me the thumb up, thumbs up. Okay, Carol's giving me the thumbs up. Lisa's giving me the thumbs up. Okay, I think we have a quorum. I think this is what we're going to do. But feel free to drop uh, questions in the chat or to unmute yourself and ask, really. Um, I can multitask and I, you know, really want to make sure. I, I tend to get really excited when I teach and I can like start talking super fast and spin out of control. So if you need me to slow down or explain, or if you want to contribute, then please feel free, you know, tell us, co-create this space together. So, okay. So hermit crabs, what are they? So generally they're stories or poems or essays that borrow another's shell or form, hence the new name hermit crabs. And some very common examples you might've seen out out in the wild <laughs> are complaint letters, Craigslist ad, dating profiles, field guides, holiday newsletters, how-to manuals, medical prescriptions, menus, questionnaires. I use them a lot as a mixed race person. Questionnaires, my jam. Recipes, shopping lists, syllabi, treasure maps, Yelp review. The list goes on and on and on. But basically, any kind of document, physical or digital that we're familiar with. In the past, they've often been known as the constraint essay or the false document or the Trojan horse poem. So I'm gonna just quickly look at some of those. Um, so if we look at our very first literature with Cervantes' Don Quixote, that was in fact a false document. And the whole idea of things that we think are very, you know, experimental like metafiction have actually been around for a long time, playing with a form, telling a story within a form as a false document. If you look at Robin Crusoe, a fictional travel memoir. Um, and then if you look at the Libertine epistolaries, so diaries or letters <laughs> about kind of sexual conquests, those were also kind of false documents. So we have a time-honored tradition of kind of playing with documents uh, in both fiction in, in the fictional world to kind of get ideas across. Another form that influences the hermit crab is constrained writing. And that became, I'd say, some of the most notable things that happened were in the 60s with the Olipo Collective, in which poets and mathematicians paired up and, and tried to figure out what would happen if you had constrained triggers that kind of bypass the critical mind of the writer and kind of took you into making unusual connections and lots of different possibilities. So all the all the permutations that mathematically you could think of by putting things together. And so you see uh, Raymond Cano, who kind of specialized in this whole thing, his poem on the left, 100,000 billion poems, that if you cut up the lines and then you're playing with them, you can come up with all sorts of possibilities. And those can be both writing prompts or they could lead to a piece of art itself. 
Um, and I included the mix of mutt because this is the kind of thing we do with children. We teach children to read and play in this way uh, with choose your own adventure, with these sorts of things where you cut a body into three spaces and play with it. And so this kind of playful thing is an element you'll see in the hermit crab too. And it's very useful for what I'm going to say the goal of the hermit crab can be. Um, another constraint is the abecedarian where you're just, you know, starting each line with the letter of the alphabet in alphabetical order. But, it, you know, we see it happening in a religious text. There are books of the Hebrew Bible that follow that, that, con that conceit. Uh, Chaucer's ABC follows that, but then Dr. Seuss does as well. So it can be high art, low art. <laughs> it can be for children. It can be adults. But we've been playing for a long time uh, with some of these constraints. And I'd say the third thing that uh, historically informs the hermit crab is the idea of found text. So some sort of document we found elsewhere and then did something with it. And so some of the most, we often see poets making use of this material. So the erasure poem where you would take a poem and then black out what you don't want or highlight what you do want to find a lesson inside there. Or the cento or collage poem that's created entirely of lines taken from other poems to put together for new meaning. So any kind of cut up, remix, mashup, we're used to seeing that in music and in poetry. I think one of the one of the texts where it becomes incredibly important and powerful and politically relevant is Norbesi Phillips Zong, which I have here on the left, in which uh, was the only documentation uh, that lasted when the slave ship Zong threw its African passengers overboard and drowned them uh, in order to claim the insurance money. So this, I think this was in the 18th century and the, and the insurance company filed, um, took, the, took the slavers to court. And so that small court record was all that we had to go on. And so Norbesi took that, um, oh, um, took that and and exploded that material because there was no and tried to think of how how do I give voice to the Africans who were killed who weren't there and so all of the you know each page looks differently she had a whole kind of rule of like none of the words could be above each other you'll see the pages tumbling down the you know the words and the syllables tumbling down the page as they fall into the ocean and so she really looks for what's hidden inside this text as a way of kind of reclaiming. So doing really important um, historical and reclamation work. Um, the dictionary short stories are stories that are comprised entirely of those example sentences that you see in the dictionary. So I'm gonna show um, a video essay that uses this and also uses kind of old, um, retro footage of like from um, hygiene films to kind of increase the interesting element of it. Uh -oh. Early drafts of the five stages of grief. Denial, profanity, alcoholism, darkness, lunacy, fighting, Sullen silence, fighting, cold reason, caffeine, righteous indignation, mindless violence, strong language, resigned acceptance, ice cream, sadness, 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 solitude. Archery, bakery, pottery, bravery, scenery, temptation, contrition, scripture, communion, a seven day trip for two to Hawaii. So I think I'll leave it at that. Okay. Great. Am I making sense so far? Okay. So, so this gets to the point of why would you use a hermit crab? And I feel that there are a number of ways in which it can be used. One, I think it's a very 
accessible form, provided everybody is literate and understands the form, it becomes very accessible and democratic. And I, I just taught a workshop last Friday with a group of like environmental leaders age 16 to 18, showed them a couple of examples and they were up and running. So they're very accessible, like someone sees it and they immediately understand it and they know how to hack it and it fits the documents that fit their lives. And so I like it in that sense. The other thing I like about it is that it's very low stakes because it's playful, it can allow you to do things. So one thing you can use it if you have writer's block, it's just something to play play with. But also if you have emotional resistance, if you're dealing with a topic that you think, uh, it's so big, I don't know where to begin and I don't know if emotionally I'm prepared. Or you might think people don't want to read about it. You know, they don't want to hear, you know, my sob story or they don't want to deal with this heavy political topic. And so the playfulness of it allows you to take on things that might feel too daunting otherwise. And so that's what I find very subversive about it. You can masquerade as play, but do other things. So I would say that the form is actually an invitation um, to engage in traditional oral storytelling because you're thinking about the reader, you're thinking about the audience and how they're going to experience it in the way that happens in oral storytelling. And so that found container that you take can hold topics that seem too much and can often surprise both you when you're writing them and then hopefully your readers when they're reading it. And that's kind of the most joyful thing is seeing where they intersect. And I feel the most successful hermit crabs are these ones where the form and the content fuse. And at a certain point, you realize that, that they're greater than its individual parts, that they've actually allowed you to say more than you could just straightforwardly. It's that telling it slant thing. And so that's the beauty of kind of discovering what is the form that you're that will help enhance the story, this playful form that can move into, into really interesting territory. So there's pretty much anything you can write about. Um, I found uh, one anthology called, uh, that's purely on hermit crabs. So I've quoted it from here, quoted from it here, the shell game. And in it, the, the editor says that authors frequently attempt to cram entire complex love affairs and childhoods and decades long mourning processes, devastating war stories, entire lifetimes into a single shell. And so, it's an interesting, interesting possibility. The sky's the limit. You can put anything in a hermit crab theoretically. So an example of a book length one, we could argue is Carmen Machado's In the Dream House, um, in which every chapter takes on a different genre, uh, you know, the dream house as, uh, as a romance, as a road trip, as literary analysis. She's playing with the genres, um, and using the house as um, a representation for her own body. And the reason she had to do that is because she couldn't find literary models for talking about an abusive relationship, same sex with a queer fat female body. And so she kind of had to, you know, she kept on trying this and trying that. And before she knew it, she had an entire book of kind of gestures. And so that's a bit of a hermit crab uh, in its, I think, in its influences and uh concerns. Um, I pulled a couple of examples that looked at what could be a container for grief, because we often get very overwhelmed about writing about grief. And also, sometimes we feel like we don't have the right that other people aren't going to want to read about it. And so an example here is idea of a Capricorn's weekly horoscope while her father is dying of cancer. The day is young. Dress smart today, Capricorn. Big things on the horizon. Beware of rain so cold it will raise entire armies of goosebumps and phone calls from your mother about your dying father. Tap shoes are the new vans. You'll be taking a trip today, Capricorn. Enjoy the little things like French vanilla cappuccinos from gas station service counters. Trust the doctors, but not hospital vending machines. Watch for asteroids. And so you see there's this mixture of like serious and humorous, big and small. It allows this kind of pivoting and these combining of things without writing, without saying, I'm writing a cancer story. So it's the, the playfulness of it that allows us to enter in different, in different areas and connect with it. Oh, which direction am I going? Why am I going backwards? This is interesting. 
Okay. Um, then there's uh, Victoria Zhang's book, Obit, which is an entire collection of poems written to look like obituaries. Uh, they're shaped like obituaries, and then they start with the death of a parent, but also talk about the reverberations of death that happen throughout that. So she herself died unknowingly on the I-405. When her mother called about her father's heart attack, she was living an indented life, a swallow that didn't dip. This was not her first death. All her deaths had creases except this one. At the hospital, Victoria Zhang cried when her father no longer made sense. This would be the last thing she cried in front of. So um, then it's an entire kind of investigation and meditation on all the types of deaths that happen. Um, and it becomes, we become interested in kind of reading about all the levels of, uh, of this experience. Um, here's one that uses light bright. Do people remember that game, the little light bright that you would put little plastic things on top of a, of a, a plastic, you would put like little lights and you would create these designs. It was a, a, a game in the eighties, I think. And so this person is using it as um, a narrative of trauma and it's um, page after page of different light brights that are kind of creating a concrete poem um, and the colors and the arrangement and then just what is said and what's not said when we get the whole page with just fire. So it's operating as if it were a poem, but if you are familiar with the light bright, then it takes you, it transports you back to that time. So there's only one serious requirement of the, of the hermit crab, and that is that someone is gonna understand the form, that it's got to be some sort of formal form that's recognizable. So that begs the question, when we do these globally or cross-culturally, can we count on people knowing what the forms are or is there a way in which you can signal what the form is? Do you physically have to make it look like that or are there ways that you can open the form up? Um, I mean, I've read ones, the ones these students did last week, they were you know, using environmental and science things and I wasn't necessarily aware of the form myself, but there's a way in which I could understand the conventions of the form. So you just have to be thinking about that um, will your audience recognize the form? Are you giving enough information so that they can see the play that's involved? Um, okay, I feel like I'm just talking and talking. <laughs> Let me stop sharing for a second and see how people are doing. Okay. Oh yeah, great, right. Okay, so how are people doing? It's okay. It's not just like a crazy person lecturing in a box here. No, it's great. Okay. I think, I think it's fascinating. And people love your glasses. <laughs> <laughs> you came for nothing else. You came for those, right? <laughs> but I think the information is great too. <laughs> okay. I love the range of examples, how visual some of them are, how, how much visual figures in, in the examples that you gave. Oh, just wait. <laughs> Because I love visual ones. <laughs> I just want to make sure I don't end up spending all our time. Yes, because I want to give you time to write. So I actually probably am going to have to speed through a lot of them and not read them just to show you what's there because it's already 425 for me. So yeah, so cool. So I'm going to give you a lot of examples and we aren't necessarily going to have time to discuss them. Is that okay? I always try to do too much. Okay. So this is the regret to inform you. This is by Brenda Miller, who's probably the person who gave the idea of, who probably named it the hermit crab. This is a series of rejection letters. Um, and it starts with parents saying, sorry, your drawing wasn't good enough to go up on the refrigerator. And then it just continues on and on. So this one is like 10th grader, thanks for your application to be the girlfriend of one of our star basketball players. As you might've imagined, we received hundreds of similar requests. This is to inform you, you've not been chosen for a coveted position, but we invite you to continue hanging around the lockers as if you belong there. This selfless act will help the team members learn the art of ignoring lovesick girls. Um, and then the next one is about her three-year audition to serve as the white girlfriend and savior to a Native American man, 12 years your senior. So it's just a series of letters and letters. Um, and then some of them become quite metaphorical at the end, but it's really a great way of kind of dealing with 
um, rejection. This is a voter script. So they took an actual get out the vote script and did a kind of an erasure on top of it to kind of deal with the last um, election we had and kind of, you know, so we know life is very challenging for anyone still in her, his, her, their right mind during this unprecedented pandemic, racial unrest, voter suppression, climate disaster, federal military attack on citizenry. If the respondent is still listening, you may continue. Do you require any of the following? Protection against police brutality, protection against systemic racism, protection against incessant government gas gaslighting. So this, you just take a, you know, this is easy. You just take a form and then just kind of hack it in the way to kind of emotionally get get at what's going on, um, and also the the um, the impossibility of trying to call someone during this time. Uh, this one is a medical prescription um, to discourage love with married inappropriate men. Swallow the first thing in the morning before you have second thoughts. Before you have any thoughts. Um, before using this medicine, be sure you are currently having an affair with a man married at least seven years. Be sure this is not your first affair. Um, do not take this medicine if you are also susceptible to alcoholism or other addictions. Um, how to use this medicine. Wash hands as vigorously as Lady Macbeth. Sterilize cups. Sterilize everything. So instead of being mad at yourself, you can kind of play with this like, okay, this is my sickness and then literally turn it into a sickness. Um, this is from me. Um, all of mine are always questionnaires because if you're, if you have multiple identities, you hate, you hate having to answer either or questions. So this is about going to the doctor and being like racially profiled. And the doctor is like, how can you say you're Nigerian if you weren't born in America? So then I break it down into, you know, how I would answer like differently to different people to Americans uh, they would say what you're considered white in Nigeria that's hilarious Americans who say but you were born in America so Nigeria is not really home Nigerians who say Africa West Africa Nigeria which state ah, you know Nigeria did you marry a Nigerian to get that name Nigerians who say yes but have you ever been to Nigeria Nigerians who say yes fine but do you speak Igbo <laughs> so all the ways in which people question your identity and try to get you to prove it also by going to the doctor so I was literally having an eye exam but he was you know testing me on my identity. Um, so then there's the question of how do we choose a particular form that feels organic and not just like a gimmick? Um, and so I'm really thinking about like, is there a way, is there um, a training that you've had? You know, I'm a professor, so oftentimes I think of syllabi. I'm mixed race, so I think of uh, questionnaires. Um, is it the topic itself or is the kind of training that you have and the kinds of forms and discourse that you're familiar with? Um, this is another one that a friend wrote, um, I think just out of annoyance um, for, you know, uh, the covers, the cuts, a pop quiz for white women who think black women should be nicer to them in conversations about race. And it starts with true, false, gender oppression is way worse than racial oppression. Um, and, you know, and then getting down to the multiple choice at the end. I don't know the historical origins of whiteness, but I'm qualified to say what black women need to do because I know about sexism. I'm a good person. I'm an anti-racist ally. I have curly, hard to tame hair. My BFF and undergrad was black. So this is my friend. She just wrote that. So like all different ways of like kind of channeling uh, things you have to deal with. And it gets to it really quickly. You don't have to write a lot of narrative behind it just by including the things that people say is a really great way to uh, do a hermit crab. These are two syllabi that kind of show internally what's going on. I'll tell you exactly how to get an A, but you'll have a hard time hearing me. I could hardly hear my own professors when I was in college over the din and roar of my own fear. Um, versus this other one where it's actually written as a syllabi. It's got the, it's every week it has a different text of what the discussion question is gonna be. And in this one, while you'll discuss, I've got to go into the hallway to return a phone call. A friend called to say, I left a scary message on her voicemail at two o'clock in the morning. I'm gonna tell her I'm fine. I'm in class going over a story with an unnamed narrator. It won't be a lie. This is my story. So uh, this is the one, this is playing with the idea of those math word problems. And it's dealing with basically um, being a woman of color in the corporate world. So 
if you know Marisol's parents immigrated on a train traveling 55 miles per hour and Nadal Ferris' parents immigrated on a plane moving 800 miles per hour and they're the only non-white women at the staff meeting, how frequently would they be called by each other's name? So again, we all recognize those word problems and getting to the idea of another type of problem in the classroom. So when you're doing it, you have to think about what do hermit crab essays anticipate in terms of reader knowledge uh, and how much can you deviate from the rules, you know, just so long, you know, sometimes it might just be kind of the title suggests um, what the form is and you're like veering from it or recreating it. And then sometimes you might really just want to um, really follow the, the, you know, the form word for word, but, you know, just along there's a gesture towards it. I don't think people are going to be like, wait a minute, you know, a syllabus is supposed to be exactly this, this, that. It's once you get that recognition, then then you can do what you want with it. Um, okay, so now we're going to really get to some physical ones, some visual ones. So this is from my PowerPoint story. I used to tell the story of my husband and my love affair, and we had gotten together three times. And every time I would say, people would be just like, oh my God, I need a chart. Like what? And then I was like, I'm going to do a PowerPoint. <laughs> and so I did, it's, it's an oral story. It's got all these PowerPoints in it. I'm trying to talk about, the, you know, all the different comings and goings and also the identity issues here. So what do PowerPoints have? They have charts and graphs built into them. So then I try to say, you know, a kind of a side thing that I actually really wouldn't uh, wanted to talk about, but that I had this insecurity around my racial identity with this dating. So the fact that he, a born and bred Nigerian, wouldn't marry you and abandoned by your Nigerian father and raised abroad half Nigerian after what was starting to feel like a 25 year audition was beginning to be a problem. And so then I just have that visually there. And when I read this story, I don't read the asides and the audience immediately reads them out loud for me, which is great and them getting involved. Um, this is digital. This is someone who's, it's a fictional story where she takes an old school um, website and the conceit is that these angels take over her website and like drive her crazy. And so they're the ones who are crossing out and accusing her of doing things. So she's like, leave my website alone. And they're like, nice try, Marsha, the fall of the side of Marsha. And each uh, page of the story is a, in a, one of these like very old fashioned homemade uh, websites where she's like battling with control of <laughs> why do you want to wreck my one good thing um and it's very similar to uh jennifer egan's the visit from the goon squad which was uh fiction but making use of these kinds of forms as well um using the body so this these are two examples on the left someone has taken one of these hair straightening cream labels and has you know erased and created some stuff about it um, you know, so there are the examples she's taking notes, the eight minutes, the five minutes, eventually you'll, you'll learn that beauty ain't worth the burn girl. Why are you bothering to do this? If you ain't even going to leave it in long enough. So just really playing with the, the, the label. And then the other one, it looks as if it's, um, a dress form, but it's actually quotations from people on the border, like crossing the border. So it is a map of border trauma talking about how borders are in fact impacting bodies. Um, and it's a kind of an infogram with little things on it. So that's an example as well. A um, couple of bingo cards. My students really like these ones, microaggression bingo. So again, you don't have to tell a lot of things of what's going on to you. You just put a scenario or you put something that someone says, oh, you don't see Muslim. Um, I went to India once to find myself and then in the middle, don't leave your home for a day and you're safe. So what does Muslim food taste like? But America is so much safer for women. So you can just take these quotes of things you've had to deal with and just put them on to the bingo card or the, the crossword puzzle here, which is written by an adoptee. And so it's showing kind of the, you know, the things she's dealing with. Um, and, and as an adoptee, she deals a lot with forms too. So she has, um, you know, she has her adoption forms. Um, and then at a certain point, she has this exiles crossword where we've got Korea mother juxtaposed memory. So showing uh, some of the things that she's dealing with uh, internally. Da, 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 da. I thought I saw a, a chat question, but maybe not. Um, there's the choose your own adventure that I'd mentioned before. 
Um, and this one starts with the whole idea of kind of all the stranger danger that came up. And so every version uh, is following and, you know, following that. So like, what if you get in the van with, with the man and it has this whole kind of elaborate scenario, or what if you take the candy apple or, you know, all of the, all of the kinds of legends, urban legends in the eighties of what would happen to you are written out as a choose your own adventure in this one. It's very funny. So, um, yes, so the idea of the form and content being interdependent, as I said, and then can really, you know, kind of synergistically support each other. Uh, to territorial stuff, I, I love to use maps. There's Mr. Plimpton's Revenge, where someone has charted his encounter with Mr. Plimpton and saves them as, you know, where you can um, do your favorites. And so every time you click on one of these favorites, it has a little vignette of his interactions with uh with George Plimpton. Um this one is from um a mapping exercise uh here in the mission in San Francisco. Um what this was done by an undergraduate and it's finding two things that juxtaposing two things you wouldn't imagine together. So this is like fancy bakeries and patisseries with gang activity. So then juxtaposing them together creates this interesting narrative about gentrification as well as other things. There was another one that showed Tinder activity against cycles of the moon. So just visually giving you a, a new way of, of kind of making connections that you wouldn't expect. And then some of the little quotes here are things coming from Yelp, like what people have said about the place. Um, this is Jeff Walter's idea of using the statistical abstract. So he starts with quotes about his hometown, which is I, I actually coincidentally where I was born. Um, really kind of playing with the idea of can you really capture a town and these kind of, you know, these kind of statistics. And then he kind of follows a particularly interesting thread, two threads actually, uh, and makes up a statistic. On any given day, there are more adult men per capita riding children's BMX bikes than any other city in the world. And follows. I'm never sure where these guys are going on these little bikes, their knees up around their ears as they pedal. They all wear hats, ball caps in summer, stocking caps in winter. So he follows that and then he gets to kind of the poverty underlining his neighborhood and how that impacts um, domestic violence. But there's this kind of witty, humorous things moving through as well. So playing with statistics and how do you capture a city? So whew, I moved through it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Did it. Okay. Any crabbing questions? Nope. Okay. In that case, let's get started. Are you ready to get started? Okay. So hopefully some of you have ideas already, but if not, um, you can start brainstorming some topics that seem like you've wanted to write about them. Maybe you're already starting to write about them, but there's something that might feel a little complex or risky. And then you might think about what are some forms or documents that either link to the topic, they seem like just totally organically connected, or they seem completely crazy, like gangs and cupcakes. Um, they can be visual, they don't have to be visual. Um, or they can be things that you're familiar with. You know, I'm a school teacher, therefore I always have to create these types of forms and I would approach it in that way. Or I'm a doctor and I always write scripts or whatever like that. So then you can start to play with, or or maybe there was one that you were already inspired by and you're like, I'm just going to take that. I've got this label and I'm going to start to, you know, you want to do your own version in response to one of the examples that saw um, that you saw. But um yeah, so let's take, let's start with 20 minutes and I will check in with you. Yay. And feel free to message me if you have questions.
There's a question in the chat. Right. Someone has asked whether they can use a hermit crab in a novel.
Okay, so that has been 20 minutes. Is that enough time? We've made some progress in the world of hermit crabbing? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I'm trying to think, do we want to... I'm looking at the number of people. We have about 30 people. Do we want to share in small groups? Do we want to just do a little sharing in the larger group? I want to, how much time do you want to say, say for Q&A till I'm asking the organizers who are muted? <laughs> we don't have a lot of questions in the, in the, um, probably now I said that we will get a dozen or so, but right now there's not a lot of questions. Um, so, I mean, I, I would think that 10 minutes would be sufficient if we all of a sudden get a lot of questions, I'll let you know. Okay. Okay. Terrific. So, um, I don't know how you, if you normally do online stuff, do you put people in small groups or, um, do we want to do some large group sharing? Does anyone have any um, preference? Because if you share in small groups, more people can share. Um, of but we can okay. So I see some preferences for large groups. Okay, large groups. Okay, and that that just requires discipline. <laughs> Keeping in mind <laughs> the good of the community. <laughs> so so. Um, okay, so is there someone who would like to share a quick 30 second read or talk about what they did? Maybe, you know, just the title or whatever. Yes, hello. Um, Hi. I am Malachi. My camera is kind of weird, so I've been keeping it off. Um, but yeah, I wanted to say thank you for this because I, I came to this class with the concept in mind. Um, I did a residency in France this summer and I've been wanting to write about some of the hard feelings I've had, but in the form of like a peppy travel blog. <laughs> um, yes. And I, I was really struggling to get it out. And within these past 20 minutes, like it, it started to come forth. So I just wanted to say thank you for that. And that's what I wanted to share. Yeah, that's wonderful. I love that. I love that. Do you have a title or a first line you'd love to drop on us? Yeah, so I've decided to, um, so this is for my newsletter that I send out every month, and I've decided to break it down into three kind of mini articles, because these kinds of travel articles tend to be really short. Mm -hmm. um, and so the three mini articles I have are how to flirt your way through France, top yes. 10 reasons to learn French and how not to look like a French tourist. So <laughs> those are going to be my, my three little ones uh, in there. I love that. <laughs> That's great. Can you, um can you tag me if that does get out in the world? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Great. I'm, I'm meeting faith on the socials. <laughs> I love that. Just, you know, I could use some advice on how to flirt my way across France. <laughs> That's great. Okay, Lisa. Yeah, I'll just talk about what I did. I started off with the idea of using the holiday letter because I thought that's such a great format, but quickly abandoned it and instead went with um, the very familiar form of an instruction manual. And mm -hmm. my instruction was uh, instructions for getting your husband to retire. <laughs> and it um, is in a numbered form, a series of steps towards buying some land that would distract him enough so that he had to stop his job to spend time on this land. And I not only did that in enumerated steps, but I have footnotes yes. to expand on some of the topics that are or the mentions that are in the list. So it was sort of fun to think about these tiers of communicating. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love that. How to, how to distract those husbands. <laughs> That's great. Thanks for sharing that. Wonderful. Um, Allison. 
Hello. Um, so I was really inspired by the example you gave of a bingo card. Um, that just looked like fun. So I did deaf student bingo, and here's what I have so far. I have teacher goes to the bathroom while wearing your assisted listening device. Fellow student says you only got into this program because of your disability. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's really rough. You got to have a straight face when they come back in. Um, <laughs> someone asked how you became deaf and gets disappointed when you shrug. <laughs> Someone sits in your assigned seating for preferential seating and it feels too childish to ask for it back. Everyone laughs at the joke the student in the corner of the room makes except you. And that's how far I am. Oh my gosh, I love it. I love it. That's so good. <laughs> and so very disturbing too. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Deborah. Yeah. Hold on, let me figure out how to put my hand down. Okay. I know, right? <laughs> Hi, this is wonderful. Um, I love deaf bingo. Wow. That's yeah. that's wonderful. So I'm a I'm a um healthcare provider, and so I decided to use the soap note, which is um how healthcare providers write their encounters with a patient. And the oh. S is subjective and the O is objective and the A is assessment and the P is plan. So mm -hmm. I got kind of a little bit in this. Can I read it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So S, patient is a 15-year-old female in no apparent distress here for her yearly physical. Her mother accompanies her. She is her custodial parent. Patient is a sophomore at St. Anne's, is an honor student, and social activities are limited to taking care of her younger sister and brother while her mother works. She denies alcohol or recreational drug use and sexual activity. She states that she is having trouble with classmates because they refuse to call her by her preferred pronouns, which are they, them. Objective, blood pressure 120 over 86, heart rate 100, BMI 30. Patient is oriented times three, denies alcohol and recreational drug use, PHQ-9 is, whoops, I already said that. PHQ-9 is 29 and significant for fatigue, difficulty falling asleep, and feeling like a failure. She denies suicidal thoughts. Heart regular, heart regular rhythm, no gallop or rub. Lungs clear, abdomen soft, neuro exam negative. Assessment, well-developed 15-year-old obese female. P, plan, discuss diet and exercise. Oh, wow. That's great. That's great. I love how so many of the, they have double meaning, right? Yeah. So much. That's really good. Thank you. And I love learning about a new form. That's really cool. Morgan. You're muted still. Still muted. Morgan, you're muted. Sorry. Okay. Right. Um, I I am a volunteer at Safe Passage and also a survivor of domestic violence. So I wrote a recipe for domestic violence. Mm. Um, I don't want to read it because it's kind of messy at the moment. But I have ingredients and the procedure, and I didn't get all the way, but I, I it, it stopped at entered two police officers. Mm. Uh, anyway, that's as far as I got. Oh, that's great. I'm really glad that you took that on. It's wonderful. Hmm. And how did it feel writing it? Um, well, actually, hmm. I was too focused on trying to get, you know, the the recipe, the ing ingredients and things into what I was say saying, you know, uh, mm -hmm. that someone had um, two cups of pestiness and someone had three cups of pint of anger and stuff like that. But it was a little hard to do. So, uh -huh. Okay. Well, I hope you'll revisit it. And yeah, I will try and work it up on some more. Yeah, that's great. Wonderful. 
Yeah, and it can be a combination of your own and others' experiences. I think that's kind of the beauty of it too. Almost like a collective, um, a collective text there with multiple experiences. Yeah. And the contents to the actions, directions to the serving. Yeah. Recipes are really, really good. Darlene, welcome down. Hi. So I'm um, writing a memoir, working on like uh, generating all these memories, you know, so that I can pick and choose. And so this is an awesome way to kind of like generate stuff, right? That is a little complicated. So anyway, um, I was thinking about coming of age stories and um, I started thinking about when I started menstruating as a young woman. So that's a pretty difficult topic. And I ended up saying to coming up with a, a title that said, why didn't just somebody tell me that boys don't get their period, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and that, that came out to be the topic, you know? And um, I thought about how my mother and our culture, uh, c culturally, it, there's some taboo things you don't talk about, particularly many years ago and in, our, in my culture, we didn't get prepared for that. But then when it happened, it was announced to the world, you know? And yes. so I have this um, little memory of that and just thinking to myself, like, why didn't my brothers go through that, you know, kind of thing. And so that was the container that I used. Wow. I love that. Wow. <laughs> so interesting. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. Wonderful. That's great. Did other people remember things? It sounds it sounds almost like you recovered a memory there. Like this was an opportunity to to remember something that maybe you hadn't really thought was worthy of literature. And so I'm wondering if other people like remembered things through this process. It was very generative, actually. Yes, it was very free flowing. I thought you know once I thought about that memory about coming of age in that way and then it just started to flow yeah yeah Let's see. here in the chats D, D character sheet for a character who has long covid whoa and a pet cat having a difficult difference that sounds fascinating A dinner placement, dinner placement, SFF publishing dinner. Excellent. And Buster Hathaway. Oh, sorry, Christina. Yeah. Hello? Hi. Yeah, I can hear you. Great. Okay. Um. I made like a short one and a more longer form one. And the short one, um, my friend sent me like a plushie she got from Japan, and it came with a little gotcha slip, like that shows like the other plushies you can get from the capsule machine. So I took the picture, and I, um, like put like a captions over it. I don't know mm -hmm. Japanese, but it's just like, I'm just using the form of it. Mm -hmm. So it's called the capitalist gotcha machine of life. Because when you use a, a capsule machine, you like get a random thing. Mm -hmm. And under it, it says, good luck. So the things you can get are burnout, inflation, <laughs> overconsumption, imposter syndrome, climate mm -hmm. crisis, and back problems. Oh my goodness. I love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, genius. <laughs> um, the longer form one. It's um, it's not really done. Mm -hmm. I feel like it, there needs to be a lot of development for it. But it's like patch notes of a game where mm -hmm. somebody starts off really passionate about their project that they're doing by themselves, mm -hmm. and then they slowly like lose their willingness to work on it because it's like really hard and they didn't expect it to turn out the way it did. Mm. 
So there's slowly less and less in the patch notes until they just stop updating it because they don't want to work on it anymore. <laughs> okay. So yeah, that reminds me a bit of that that website one. Yeah. So yeah. So that's it. Oh, that's great. You got some love in the chat here too. So the people who understand that form. So that's that's really cool. I love that you started too. Like in just 20 minutes, you got a lot done. Thanks. Yeah, it was pretty fun. Oh, great. Thanks for sharing. A couple of people had asked about putting a hermit crab in the middle of something you're already doing, in the middle of a chapter or an essay. So I was wondering how those worked out. Those folks are still here. Cheryl, Shika. But that's definitely something you can do. The example of the the crossword one crossword puzzle was um, that was just like in the middle of her memoir. Uh, it just kind of sat there, and um, I dropped the links. And I have two new chapbooks that ca that came out, and they're both um, they're both from an original big family memoir. But I really wanted to kind of lean into the experimentation. So one of them is written as a screenplay because it's about how interested in film in kind of American mythology my family was. As my immigrant family's becoming American, they're watching a lot of films. So I ended up writing as a screenplay to kind of show performance and that sort of thing. And then the other one is more kind of a, I'm trying to remember my grandmother's voice. And so it's it's got a collage element, but it's also how to, like, how do you make a film? How do you resurrect someone, someone from the dead? How do you recover a memory? And so it's just a series of kind of like how to and collages. Um, and I think that those demonstrate uh, kind of emotionally what's going on, as well as giving other opportunities to kind of wrestle with things and revisit. Um, and so I think also whenever you're using non-traditional elements, you want to do it more than once to kind of establish a sort of patterning so that the reader knows how to experience it. But um, sometimes you can just do it for yourself. Like words are failing me at this point you know, what might be just a physical thing that will help me like another way in another approach. Um, you can do a series of them and sometimes they might just help you figure out what's going on or they can be the thing that's actually in the text offering a different opportunity, um, a different type of engagement. So they can be really great. Um, and they provide an emotional break too, I think. Anyone else want to share or ask questions? I'm going to say we have about 10 minutes left. So if folks want questions answered, now's the time to do it. <laughs> I know. I feel like I should have let them write more. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would like to, I always struggle with, um, the organic versus the I'm just being too damn clever part. Mm -hmm. um, and how, how, what criteria do you use for figuring that out? <laughs> That's a good question, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think on some level, I think if you're trying too hard to just make everything be kind of perfect, like you're actually kind of changing the story so it'll fit the form i think that that could be it um i think there's a point where it just feels like oh yes this is the form that's allowing me to do what i want and it just they kind of you know you might be struggling initially and then at some point you kind of hit your stride and they feel like it, you're even like maybe even encouraged to go deeper than you would imagine you were just like oh you know oh what was this about and so that's when i think that you've you've found the right form. You've been listening closely enough to, to what the story has told you it wants. Um, and you're able to like even go further than you had thought or it's all kind of coming together, I think. 
Um, and if it feels like it's really organically your form too, you know, as opposed to, you know, yeah, kind of like, oh, this is a cool hip form that I want to do. Like, am I eating, eating avocado toast because everybody's eating avocado toast? Or like, am I really an avocado girl? Um, so I think that can sometimes be it. Um, and then when people respond, I think also, so this is what the beauty of this, like you just, it just took 20 minutes. You can immediately get a response and have people, you know, um, letting you know whether, you know, they resonate with that. I was inspired by the maps with the vignettes. So I did vignettes that go along with my garden plans. It was very playful. I plant pink and white stretcheraniums. Will I not get a hate crime neighbor with a Trump sign? Mm. Love that. This is really cool. Working on D&D character. Mm. Yeah. So I don't know if that answers your question. I think a lot of it is just kind of uh, you get that gut feeling, right? If it feel if it feels real. Um, yeah, it's true. True with a lot of things about writing. It's like, am I doing this for the story? Or am I doing this for me? <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a and it's a great thing to play with just to kind of get a different sense. And so some of it you might be like, oh, it served its function as a writing exercise as a prompt of helping me get over my um, writer's block and I have something, but this isn't really the, f the form it's going to live in. I, you know, I want to do more versus like, oh, this really feels like something, you know, this is the form I want to have it live in, uh, which is not to say you can't explore in other forms as well too. You know, sometimes I, you know, take things through a variety of, of things, um, variety of tools to figure out uh, ultimately what I want to have have you know be the final final form uh that you know it's just like when you're crafting a metaphor too you know you're cra you're you know you're casting around for these different symbols and like is this the one is this the one? <laughs> are you my mother are you my metaphor <laughs> you know and then there's the one that like ah that lands that really feels you know like it's doing it's doing the work and it almost even surprise surprises you i think um would be it well, thank, thank you for joining us and thank you for everything you've given us. I think people are absolutely fascinated by the examples and all the wide variety of things you can do. Yay. <laughs> um, and again, I just want to put another little plug in for Straw Dog. If you like this um, seminar, we do them every month. So, oh, so, does somebody have their hand up? I think it's just clapping. Okay. Right. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> I just didn't want to, I didn't want to cut anybody off. Um, we do this every month. Sign up for our newsletter. You will get um, become a member. You will get all the information about um, great, great um, workshops every month. And thank you, Faith, very much for doing this. Um, and um, I think we all learned quite a bit. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm going to put my socials and stuff in there. So you can also sign up for my newsletter. Um, my website is just my last name. My social media is Meeting Faith, which is the name of my first book. And uh, I also put links to the two chat books in there if you want to right. support a starving writer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And thank you for the love in the chat. Love it. And thank you so much for Straw Dog Writers inviting me to come and do this and making it open to everybody. I really appreciated that, too, that I could like share it with my community and let folks know. Uh, around the country so that was really cool I, I also i also have to share that that when when i when i first contacted faith she goes oh straw dog there's the people those are the people who do emergent writings at the mount and, um, and i thought wow we've made it all the way to california unfortunately the emerging the emerging writers um closed on october 1st but uh, i am glad that we made it all the way to california and you were encouraging your students to to apply yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Somebody asked about the recording. Um, the recording will go up on YouTube in just a few days. You can watch the um, the Straw Dog YouTube channel, um, and it will be available. And then once it's on YouTube, you can share it with all your friends. Yay! Good. Wonderful. I think that's it then. Good night, and thank you all for coming. Yeah, we ended early. <laughs> <laughs> Not very many minutes early. <laughs> yeah.
I can't even be so careful because I was like, oh, I have so many slides. I could go on forever and ever. 